Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's 420 here in Colorado. Um, I'm pleased to present two presentations today, a panel. Uh, Daniel Everding is one of my graduate students here at the University of Colorado Boulder doing astronomy education research. He'll be presenting a survey that's recently, that's soon to be published in Physical Review, uh, Physics Education Research. Um, and then Brianna Ingerman and Nick Conant, uh, two of my education coordinator and uh, theater manager, will be presenting uh, activity that they've developed, a project-based learning activity they've developed for undergraduates. Um, and our theme is really about higher education planetary use. How do we teach undergraduates in planetary settings? So with that, I will turn it over to Daniel Everding. Uh, thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. It's, yeah, technically morning here. Um, so I'd like to hopefully take control of Brianna's screen, but I can't appear to advance the slides. Try again, Daniel. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, I would like to tell you guys about uh, a recent research effort that we've undertaken here at FIS called the Planetarium Usage Survey, or PLUS for short. Um, this was a mixed methods research study into planetarium use by undergraduate learners in the United States. Um, specifically, we were looking to find out what characterizes sort of a quote unquote typical undergraduate planetarium class. Um, oh, my clicker is not clicking anymore. Sorry, Daniel, I might have to click for you. Okay. Um, this uh, research effort was a combined survey and interview protocol that sought to answer the following um, research questions about undergraduate planetarium use. Um, what materials are being presented when undergrads visit to a planetarium? Uh, what interactive technologies or strategies, if any, are being employed while they're there? Uh, which learners are visiting a planetarium and how often are they going? And finally, why are instructors using the planetarium environment for their learners? Um, the analysis of our two data pools suggests that your sort of typical undergraduate planetarium usage focuses unsurprisingly mostly on astronomy, but includes sort of a wide array of materials ranging from the astronomy adjacent earth sciences all the way to the arts with a uh, preference for digital capable theaters um, like FISC to have a greater content variety for their undergraduates. Um, typically, there are no commonplace classroom technologies like eye clickers. Um, so the sort of um, interactive audience response systems don't appear to be widespread at all in planetarium learning environments. Um, your typical undergrad user is a novice learner, non-STEM majoring undergrad that's coming about once a month. Uh, and sort of the reason that instructors ultimately are sending their learners to these environments is to provide visualization based scaffolding aid for learning a material with a distinct preference towards live presentation modalities over pre recorded video content modalities. Um, and like John said, I, uh, this work has been accepted for publication in um, the physical review, the physics education edition. So I wish we had more time to go through some of the data graphics for this work, but if you are interested, be on the lookout for Everding and Keller 2020 in a publication coming near you. Um, future work that's related to this survey effort will be a long-term distribution of a revised survey instrument that um, investigate sort of the actual mechanics of learning in the planetarium environment, still at the undergraduate level. Uh, also, we are currently working on putting together an instructor focused study that was uh, held during the 2019 2020 academic year that seek or that sought to compare um, the two learning environments that your typical undergraduate would encounter, namely the classroom and planetarium environments using a combined survey, interview, and classroom observation protocol um, study. And that manuscript is in preparation. Uh, and with that, I will hand it off to Brianna, who will tell you guys about an, a particular exercise that we run here at FISC. Great. 
Thanks, Daniel. Um, so our Survivor Challenge is a project-based learning activity uh, that we developed and tested FISC starting about four years ago. And to get you in the space of this activity, I want you to imagine that you were dropped in a random location on the earth on a random day of the year. All you have with you is a watch that's set to your time back home. So let's say Greenwich Mean Time, a globe, and just your wits about you to observe the sky. And your challenge is to figure out where you are, what's your latitude and longitude, and what time of year it is, uh, specifically what day of the year is it. So this is the challenge that we present um, some of our undergraduate student groups. And um, coming into this challenge uh, at the planetarium, they have learned some basic sky motions. So rising and setting of the stars, annual motion of the sun, uh, how to find the North Star, things like that, as well as how to use their hand as a tool for measuring angular size on the sky. Uh, so we have both intro astronomy classes as well as some ROTC classes coming in um, pretty regularly. These classes then form groups of three to four students and essentially get 50 to 115 minutes to, um, to work through this challenge. Uh, they're all dropped in the same location. And then they, um, each group gets these whiteboards. Uh, they're fairly large whiteboards, um, but manageable by, by a group uh, to write down and brainstorm their thoughts. And they get the first 20 minutes or so to brainstorm. What are you gonna observe? And how is that gonna help you try to answer this question of where and when you are? And then after that, um, students effectively get control of the dome. So they are making requests to their facilitators about what they wanna see in the sky. For example, maybe they want to go to sunset in the new location, <clears throat> excuse me, and see uh, what time their watch says at sunset. And then um, in order to make this all happen, there we have a graduate student TA as well as learning assistants. And learning assistants have, there are undergraduates who have taken the class before and are returning again to help sort of as a facilitator. And um, both of these TAs and LAs are wandering around helping groups individually. Uh, and they're actually facilitating without knowing the answer to where and when they are. And this we find helps a lot to um, engage them with their students as peers and uh, learning together, uh, as opposed to the TAs and LAs knowing the answer. And so at this point, Nick's gonna describe a little bit more about the activity. Nick, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to give you control, so I'm just going to click through for you. All right. Um, so this is a uh, set of our uh, mystery location and dates. Um, you'll notice that uh, a lot of them are biased to the northern hemisphere, particularly because we teach students how to use the North Star to uh, figure out their latitude on Earth. And they also are uh, based around sort of uh, more or less difficult locations. So by using different uh, combinations of latitude, longitude, and the mystery dates, we can use those in uh, for classes that are a little bit behind or a little bit ahead in the material, um, in case that the previous uh, they have more background knowledge for some reason. And I know somebody in the chat has mentioned that uh, this sometimes gets used in army training, and in fact we do use this sort of exercise for the ROTC, um, which is sort of like a, an introductory sort of um, uh, military program. Um, high schools and uh, colleges. So uh, we also uh, can um, use sort of the cross quarter days or the, the four corners of the year, as I like to call it, the solstices and the equinoxes and then the cross quarter days in between as a specific like locations to set, as a specific dates to set students at. Uh, those tend to be a little bit more easy for them to identify uh, the uh, mystery date, but it still uh, engages them in the critical thinking of determining the date. Um, next, you'll see that uh, we also need to have really talented navigators, operators of our planetarium, because we found that uh, when we take this activity to different planetariums, not all planetariums use uh, the planetariums in this way, or some of them, it seems like, can't necessarily tell the time of where their home location was while they are teleported to a new location. So if they want to mimic the rising of the sun and setting of the sun and stars from the new location, they need to be able to tell the time based on their watch back home. 
So you need to be able to do this accurately and with no mistakes. Now, uh, this, in this, I say here that provides a masterful understanding for the students. But those students also become operators at FISC, like myself, Matt Benjamin in the background there, Major J.B. Knopf, who's in the background of this picture, all of them, uh, you know, done activities like this in their introductory classes and ended up helping students understand this sort of content um, at FISC. Um, finally, I'll sort of end with a, an example, which is that, uh, so if a student asks something like, may we see sunrise at this mystery location at a date one month in the future, so I can help determine the date, um, what time would that be? We have to be able to be at the mystery location, be able to set it a month in the future, be able to tell what the time would be back at sunrise, back at Greenwich, for instance, or in our case, Boulder. So uh, to be able to do this requires uh, that you don't make a mistake because one mistake can throw off the whole lab. And uh, this, so the students shouldn't have to think about this at all. They should be able to just use the dome as if it's not even there, as if it's the actual sky almost without having to worry about uh, the complexity of the question being asked. Great, and um, overall we've found uh, that students really enjoy this lab a lot. We've gotten so many comments about how students find this a more helpful um, session than recitation, that they enjoyed it a lot more, that they felt like they gained a lot more out of it. Um, and we think that this lab really offers a way for students to think critically and use the dome interactively um, in a way that really bolsters their their learning. So we've been really excited to um, run this and refine it over the years. Um, and we do have a packet that we're more than happy to share with anybody who would like uh, that includes the lab, the instructor's guide, as well as the navigator's guide. Um, so just go ahead and give us an email if you're interested in having any of these resources. So thanks so much and I think we'll take any questions. All right, great. So we, we have a we have a question. Um, I noticed that one of the, your mystery locations was Reykjavik, Iceland. In Iceland, the local time is very far from solar time. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, that's a great question. There there have been certain locations and times that we have found there to be a little bit of a you know a disparity. Um, for the most part, it still gets students working through the the main thought process to arrive at these understandings. I don't know, Nick, have you experienced direct um, challenge with working at the Reykjavik location? Uh, I'm not familiar. I um, can say that it's a little bit hard to think about uh, if we have, given how early in the morning it is for me. So I might have to get back to you on that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, given that, so we ask students to get there at a very like approximate type of latitude and longitude um, and date of time. So yeah, I see that it's uh, 42 minutes off of solar time. Um, usually that's been close enough to for people to look in a globe and kind of get the rough, rough location. I think Anna said actually an hour and 42 minutes off. But... Oh, is an hour? Oh, I missed that. Okay, and, interesting. Uh, we'll have to go back and um, look more into that. Yeah. Thanks. And we have another question. Uh, what percentage of the students uh, can uh, can solve this themselves? Some of them have a, a lot faster time of solving this than others. Um, for some of them, it comes more naturally. I, I wouldn't guess at a percentage yet. Rihanna, do you have an idea? Yeah, I'd say that um, most, I mean, we, most we frequently we do this with groups of um, say 20 in the planetarium at a time as like a recitation section. Um, and I would say that most groups end up getting to the roughly correct location. Um, the most common mistake that people make is going the wrong direction in longitude. But usually facilitators, that's the kind of the role of the facilitators to try to um, slowly get those groups closer and closer without being too heavy handed about it. So we, we find that most of our groups end up getting to the, the, the correct answer. And uh, she, she also mentions that she'd be interested in getting a copy of the, of the instructions. Are those included in your paper? Oh, no, sir. I don't think we did. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to, to email those out. And if it's not too late, we can include it. Yeah, well, we can, we can always um, update that on the website. Wonderful. Great. And well, let's do one final question. I, I guess this lab acts as a filter for the most inspired students. 
who will then keep working at the planetarium. Um, how many will continue working at the planetarium for each course? Um, in general, FISC ends up hiring something like uh, up to 40 undergraduate students. And we typically get them from a variety of backgrounds. So of course, a variety of backgrounds can take the introductory astronomy courses as well. Um, but hundreds take that, that class. So I would say that um, you know, maybe uh, five to 10% of the students who end up taking an introductory astronomy course at any given year might end up volunteering or working at FISC, maybe even less. Yeah, I think we get a couple per semester that are interested in whether or not we have space to hire them is, is a little bit different. 